What is architecture? The art or science of building. A formation or construction resulting from or as if from a conscious act. A way of seeing. An incredible ego questioning our world. Get done, done, and and built them, like you look at them, matter of why I enjoy it. I think we don't have an alternative. And same as advertisers, like other companies, it is an alternative. And over and over, like an idea, you can get it all the time. The only place to do is to say, I should do it. And the most public jargon is that the public are severe, not only synonymous in the lines of the shit, by putting it in our own lives, but it's what they can imagine. For the slum combination, too. Science and fiction. The profession of designing buildings, open areas, communities, and other artificial constructions and environments, usually with some regard to aesthetic effect. Architecture often includes design or selection of furnishings and decorations, supervision of construction work, and the examination, restoration, or remodeling of existing buildings. The question, what is architecture, isn't always as straightforward as it seems. The most basic definitions are too broad, and if you ask an architect, they will often give you an answer that is way too vague. Much like the definition of art, there can be a lot of contention between building and architecture. And that's without touching the question of what makes good architecture. What is it that separates Casa Mila from Casa Americano? About giving form to the places where people live. It is not more complicated than that, but it's also not simpler than that. The best way to get at the heart of this question is to trace back its roots, and to do that, we can break down the word and find its origins. Taking off the suffix ur, indicating act or process, we are left with architect, someone who creates architecture. The word architect can be traced back to the Greek word architekton, meaning master builder, and can be further broken down into archi and tekton. Archi is related to archon, another Greek word meaning ruler, itself deriving from the Greek verb archi, meaning to be the first or to rule. Archon was used when describing the chief magistrates of ancient Athens. While this might imply an implicit higher authority in those titled archon, it really only means the highest authority within a group and was used generally throughout Greek history. So far this hasn't told us too much we don't already understand, but it's in this last section that we find the most insight. Tecton is understood to mean carpenter, or more generally, builder or craftsman. The word was used to describe Jesus' profession in the Bible. Tecton comes from the Proto-Indo-European root tect or tex, which can be used to describe a wide variety of fabrication methods, but is typically associated with weaving, wicker, and work done with an axe. Remember that part for later. So there's our answer. Architecture is the product of a lead builder. Perhaps not quite the insightful answer we were looking for, but we did learn one thing. The idea of an architect has distinctly ancient Greek origins. Now this isn't to say that anything built before or without the influence of the ancient Greeks can't be architecture, but when it comes to the idea of a lead designer as understood in the Western world, the ancient Greeks are a reasonable enough origin for us to start from. A discipline where you can have multivalent interests. You could be a philosopher, a geographer, a scientist, an artist, an engineer. You can be poetic about it. Now, understanding the design philosophy of the ancient Greeks is quite difficult, as there are no surviving documents that describe them firsthand. There is, however, De Architectura, better known as the Ten Books on Architecture, written by Vitruvius sometime in the later half of the first century BCE. While a Roman man himself, the book does feature a lot of discussion of Greek design. Whether these accounts are firsthand or invented by Vitruvius is not really known, but it is safe to assume that these accounts have some amount of historical basis, and regardless of their validity, the theories posited had a massive influence on the architects of the Renaissance. This was the time when the idea of a single architect was just starting to become popular. In fact, you probably know of Vitruvius from The Vitruvian Man, a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, taking the proportions of the human body from Vitruvius's writings. The scope of work in De Architectura is far broader than what might be expected from the modern definition. 
In addition to describing the designs of most varieties of building of the time, Book 9 explores the sciences related to the field, including, of all things, astronomy. The tenth book would make more sense in a book about engineering, as it covers war machines, pneumatics, and other Roman technologies. This all lines up with the idea of the Renaissance man, an idea which drew heavily from ancient writings such as these, where architects were also artists, engineers, sculptors, and city planners. Vitruvius dedicated an entire section of the first book to describing the qualifications needed to be an architect. These include a strong knowledge of math, science, astronomy, art, music, and construction. From this, we can understand there was a significant difference between the education expectations of architects and other builders. This is helpful for understanding the origins of the profession, but only tangentially gets us closer to understanding what architecture is. Sure, it broadens our list of things that may be architecture, but that only makes things harder to parse through. But De Architectura wouldn't have become so well known if all it did was list the ways of building things. Vitruvius states that architecture is composed of two things, the act of construction and the theory behind it. This dichotomy excellently displays that even back then there was a difference between building and architecture, the key difference being that of artistic theory. The theory that Vitruvius proposes is that of three tenets of good design, those being utilitas, firmitas, and venustas. Utilitas, utility. It should be suitable for the purposes for which it is used. Firmitas, durability. A building should stand up robustly and remain in good condition. Venustas, beauty. It should be aesthetically pleasing. Without all three of these qualities, a building is not architecture. These points follow through his writings as he goes on to define the classical orders, using them as the key for showing a building's strength and beauty through their detailing and proportions. The books in which he describes different categories of building file under the utility banner. To a certain extent, these two things are separate, although he does create distinctions between some of the appropriate styles to use for certain building types. And at last, we have arrived at some kind of answer. Architecture is the intersection of building and good design philosophy. However, we must remember that this isn't necessarily the true origin of architecture, so these ideas might not be present at the origination of the discipline. Vitruvius himself mentions Pythias's commentaries and a book on the subject by Varro, meaning that architectural treatises were not a novel idea. Unfortunately, none of these writings have lasted through the ages. Supposed to complete nature, great architecture makes nature more beautiful. It gives it power. While we may not have first-hand accounts of the origins of architecture, there have been many architectural theorists over the centuries that have proposed their own ideas about the conception of architecture. The most famous of these is the primitive hut theory posited by Marc-Antoine Luger in his Essay sur l'architecture. Unlike those who came before him, he rejected the Baroque style of ornamentation as the ideal way to create architecture, instead pushing for an analysis of nature and basic formal proportions as the focus of study. Proportionality was certainly an important part of architectural design up to this point, being the basis for the sizings of the classical orders, but until this point it had been used as just the starting point for design, to be embellished by ornament, and it was always based upon the ruins of Greece and Rome, or upon established ratios like the Golden Rectangle. Leon Battista Alberti starts De Re Edificatoria, the first book on architecture of the Italian Renaissance, with a discussion of geometry and ratios, but four of the last five books are focused exclusively on ornament. Logier asserts that by looking at architecture's most basal form, one can create architecture without inappropriate embellishments. He tells a story of a man in nature, enjoying its pure, untainted beauty. When beauty subsides and storms roll in, he seeks shelter under trees and in a cave, finding both to be inadequate. With a newfound desire for shelter, the man assembles the primitive hut. Four vertical posts, four horizontal beams, and two inclined planes form this structure, becoming the basis for the column, entablature, and pediment. These are the basic elements that Logier argues make up all architecture. All other elements, including windows, doors, and even walls, came later, and are therefore secondary. Logier's theory inspired many architects of the time and encouraged the examination of local vernacular architecture. 
It does not, however, find success in describing the most primitive form of architecture. One of the reflections of the permanence of a civilization. The connections between Logier's primitive hut and Greek temple forms is undeniable. Logier himself identifies Maison Carré as an example of an embellished primitive hut. The bias towards classical forms isn't a fault of the author, as it was simply the known way of building at the time. And looking at basic elements of architecture, it isn't necessarily a bad approach to the issue. But when looking at actual primitive huts, they are most often composed of only one or two elements, always a roof, and usually walls, unless the roof extends all the way to the ground. What's also interesting is the fact that these structures have no bias towards orthogonal forms. In fact, many of the most primitive dwellings feature rounded walls. Whether this be due to the structural integrity of rounded shapes or the ease of construction is up for debate, but the rectilinear forms Logier upholds only seem to develop as construction technology develops. But Logier's theory is not without merit. His theory sparked an interest in analyzing the vernacular outside of Italy, and many others designed their own primitive huts. It is generally accepted that the fluting of classical columns was done to mimic the bark of the tree trunks that originally made the wooden precursors to the long-lasting marble monuments we know today. The idea that man began with wood and evolved to using stone is, as far as we can tell, accurate in places with abundant tree sources. However, this does not account for the numerous indications of earthen building being a starting point. If we remember the Proto-Indo-European word tect, we can begin to infer some things. Trying to connect weaving or wicker work to building at first seems a stretch, but one of the earliest forms of wall making is wattle and daub, where limbs are weaved together and covered in a layer of earth. Now the connection is clearer. If we consider this as a starting point for architecture, then we can understand that there has always been a level of complexity and craft associated with construction. Lagier also almost touches on something even more basal than earthworks early on in his story. Before constructing his primitive hut, man sought shelter under a tree and in a cave. The object and the void. No doubt these two ideas and their juxtaposition have strong meaning within the practice of architecture. Venturi touched upon a similar idea with the duck slash decorated shed debate, and identifying these two points as homes before homes brings up an important thought. When did man first create architecture? Were we even men? Can animals create architecture? Can animals create art? The latter is a question that has often been tested with many examples failing to prove much more than a creature's ability to hold a brush. But the question rarely gets tested on architecture. Many an elaborate bird nest and beehive have been made, but is this instinct or artistic expression? When did Neolithic humans occupying caves turn from seeking shelter into making it? The Petrification of a Cultural Moment The oldest purpose-built site ever found is Gobekli Tepe near San Liurfa, Turkey. Built almost 12,000 years ago, it is thought to be some sort of ritual gathering space. This is no surprise, as religion has been the driving force between architectural design up until the turn of the 20th century. Almost every style takes its typology from some great temple or church. So what is it about religion that causes people to want to outdo themselves? Is it the idea of a higher purpose, the desire to prove oneself worthy of the gods' favor? Perhaps it is the creation of a distinct site that allows one to feel the power of God. Following the thread of the cave and tree, we reach the clearing and the grove. Another parallel to the object void discussion, these two sites have different meanings in different cultures. In an open plain, a grove is a solid boundary through which the sky must penetrate, and in a forest, the clearing allows the wind to blow freely. It is within areas like these that sacred sites are founded. Layering creates even more sacrality. Inside the grove lies a clearing, which holds a temple which is a grove of columns, and inside that, a clearing in which to worship, a series of spaces that build up resistance and solidarity from the rest of the world. 
The deliberation in the choosing of a site for a special work is architecture. When you take an action like this, all those who enter the site will feel it and know. Adolf Loos, in 1910, wrote of a walk through the woods, coming across a mound of soil piled up over an area six by three, and coming to the realization, there is someone buried here. That somber mood hangs in the air as you come to a stop. The crunch of leaves underfoot and the silence that follows. That is architecture. A building without an emotional attachment, without any impact at all, is not architecture. It might be a big pill to swallow for some to consider a grave as architecture, but this isn't even the most extreme school of thought. In 1968, Hans Holein published Alles ist Architektur. Based purely on the title, it is clear that this is one of the more liberal definitions of architecture. The 60s were a special time in architecture, with groups like Super Studio and Archigram presenting radical ways to rebuild the world. Holine plays off these desires and declares, all are architects. Everything is architecture. His goal is to extend the ideas of architecture beyond just building. While recognizing the works of his contemporaries in cloth and plastic, he argues that they are still working with space in a typical manner. They must go beyond. The rise of telecommunications leads to a whole new dimension of experience, and he cites telephone booths as an example of that. A tiny space, one of the smallest that you can occupy, giving access to the entire world. He foresees the use of light, sound, and smell to create space. Holine's ideas of what architecture can be is incredibly outside of what had been understood before, and he isn't entirely wrong. Architecture is more than mere constructed space. This has been understood as long as architecture and building have been distinguished, but Holine argues that this could be more, and that architecture didn't have to be constructed space at all. Is a plaza formed by the buildings around it architecture? Despite its lack of construction, it still feels special. And that is the key. The emotional connection to the things we create. That is what implicates architecture over building. The art and technique of designing and building as distinguished from the skills associated with construction. So at this point, we have several nebulous ideas of what qualifies a space to be architecture. And we are now tasked with defining it. So let's summarize what we've learned. That architecture is more than that which can be found in nature. That there is a difference between building and architecture. That architecture is created by an architect or head builder, someone with knowledge of a project beyond simply understanding how it was built. That architecture can sometimes be more of a feeling of space rather than a strictly constructed one, but it must have some kind of construction to exist that architecture is subjective. None of the definitions that I've seen have managed to include all of these things in a clear and concise manner, so instead, I will propose my own definition. The deliberate creation of place. Now, I know I said concise, but this is downright abridged. However, each word holds a strong and deliberate meaning that allows for just the right amount of ambiguity. Deliberate, meaning done with careful intent. This doesn't exclude anyone explicitly, but it does exclude places built by accident and places built by just going through the motions. Creation. Put simply, there must be a specific aspect to a site that was not there before. Together, you get deliberate creation a thoughtful construction combining the two aspects an architect must have, artistic theory and scientific knowledge. But what is it that you are deliberately creating? Not just about accommodating very prescriptive demands, it's doing it in a way that stimulates the unfolding of life. That brings us to our final word, place. That capital P is important. This is more than your standard, a specific point in space definition. A place has its own special meaning in this context. It is subjective and can even exist on a scale of placeness. It would be wrong for me to strictly define place as the whole point is that it is ambiguous. 
This allows for the definition of architecture to evolve and change depending on the individual and over time as places themselves change. While I've deemed a full definition inappropriate, I can offer up a few general ideas that can help to determine if a building is a place or not. First and foremost, a place must cause some kind of emotional reaction. Positive or negative, strong or weak, it doesn't matter. The only thing that can remove a space from memory is apathy. A beautiful vista at sunset, a cathedral when the church bells ring, a graveyard in the dead of night, these places all elicit a strong reaction to the person in that place. Which brings up another point. Places have to be inhabitable. This can mean a lot of different things. Yes, an inside-outside dichotomy is key, but inside can be defined by more than walls and a ceiling. It can be one or the other. It can be the space around something significant. It can be as simple as one side of a line in the sand. Even the absence of something can create places. This all ties back to our discussion of architectural theory, specifically of the solid void split. These theories are all, in and of themselves, attempts to define places. Now, is it cheating to have a second word that needs defining in my short and sweet definition? Yes. Do I care? No. There was a reason that I chose the word place. That is because it is such a variable thing, and by capitalizing it, even those without knowledge of my definition or the deeper theories behind the word can infer its importance. When I say, think of a place, more than likely you can imagine somewhere significant. A grandparent's house, a favorite vacation spot, a secret hangout, perhaps somewhere even more personal and unique to you. I'm willing to bet that these places are shaped more by your experiences in them rather than the design of the space itself, but the space probably had some influence on the experiences. The dining room being too small for family gatherings forces the deliberate creation of eating space elsewhere. That is place. That is architecture. More than just building, it is the adaptations of the spaces we inhabit. The solutions to the problems that impede our social interactions. The changes we make upon the world. And the desire that inhabits each of us to pursue something better. Without these things, there is no architecture. And without architecture, there is no brighter future. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to know more about any of the topics in this video, feel free to check out the links in the description. If you have any topics you would like me to discuss, leave a comment down below. I'll see you in the next one.